everyone, it's Ryan with The Smart House. And on today's episode, we're gonna be making one of these. Now you may be asking yourself, what is this? Well, this is a do-it-yourself busy light, notification light, or alerting light. So I use mine on my office door to let my family know when I'm available or if I'm in a meeting or a phone call while I'm working from home. You can also use it for different statuses or alerts in your home using Home Assistant. For example, if you want a light to turn on to let you know that your alarm is set, or if you happen to leave a door unlocked or open, say a garage door, as long as you've got the appropriate gear and it's connected to Home Assistant, you can use one of these to send you a visual alert. This is great if you want a visual indicator so you don't have to always be checking your phone. This is also good if you happen to have a hearing impaired member of your family to be able to send them visual notifications that would normally be broadcast over a sound system or text speech. Now, I based this light on a great project by Hackaday user John. He has a great write-up on how to set one of these busy lights up, even though his uses a self-contained web server running on the ESP device, where we're gonna deviate from that and go using a Home Assistant controlled version using the ESP Home project. So if you wanna check it out, I've got a link to his post on Hackaday at this URL below or in the description. Now, again, we're gonna be using a lot of the hardware that he has in his project and his printable enclosure, but we're gonna deviate when it comes to software. Now, he did a great job designing this 3D printable enclosure for everything to fit into. And of course, links to those prints are available in the blog post and the description of the video. Now, you would want to be able to use the 3D printer if you have one available to make this nice enclosure. If you don't, then you can kind of hack it together using another clear plastic container or something else. If you don't have a printer or a friend with a printer, Check your local library. A lot of libraries have a 3D printer available at one of their locations that's free to use for the public. You may need to provide your own filament, but it's a great learning opportunity to get you into the hobby. You also can check your local makerspace. They might allow you to go print something there or join the club. You can also order something like this from Shapeways, where you can submit your own custom item to be printed and they'll ship it to you. Now, let me know if you might be interested in ordering a kit with either just the 3D printable enclosure or the 3D printable enclosure and all the electronics. I'm waiting to get in contact with the author to see if he would mind me offering his designs up for order. So if you'd be interested, let me know in the comments or send me a note on my social media. Now, for all of the items for this project, you'll typically order them from somewhere like Amazon or AliExpress. Now, when you do that, obviously you can't order one of every component. You'll need to order them in packs. So all told, if you ordered everything from this kit, not counting the USB cable or the enclosure, it'd run you about $35 but you'll have extra parts for other projects or you can make multiples of these and go in with a friend. Now, if you look at what's required for this project, the total cost is around $5 if you have a 3D print. So a pretty affordable project. Now for this week's video, I'm gonna do something a little bit different. Instead of making one long video with everything in detail, I'm gonna split this into two parts. The first part being this video, which is about how to set up the hardware. And the second part will be how to set up the software. Now this video should be out in a couple of days, so not to worry. So I did this to hopefully help with the YouTube metrics because longer videos get a shorter watch time. And also so I can add more detail to the next video on how to set up ESP Home. Now if you haven't used ESP Home before, it's a great foundational project actually owned and maintained by the Home Assistant team. It allows you to design your own custom lights, sensors, or other DIY projects. So please let me know if you like these multi-part video series or you'd like me to stick to the single long video. Now, of course, everything I showed today will be in the blog post that I've got linked here below or it's in the description. I've got a kit set up for everything that you need to order for this project and some optional items like a soldering iron. Of course, if you run into an issue on this project, please let me know in the comments below or feel free to ask a question on our Discord server. All right, so let's take a look at what hardware is required for this project. Before we jump into the main part of the video, let's talk about what's required for this particular project. Now, we're gonna be using an ESP-based microcontroller. Now, in this case, I'm using an ESP32. These are the same ones that I used for the ES Presence project a few months ago. So if you have a few of these laying around, these are perfectly fine for this project. You're either gonna need a D1 Mini or one of the alternative knockoff versions of that, or an ESP32. In my case, this is a slightly larger ESP32. It's got a, an extra row of pins on it. So I had to modify the case a little bit. An ES, a D1 Mini or an ESP32 will work fine for this project. Next, you're gonna need a strip of LEDs. In this case, these are WS2400. 
2812Bs. So these are five volt based LED strips that again, if you did my Hyperion project, you may have some of these left over from that. So you're only gonna need a strip of about three LEDs. As an alternative, you can buy the individual NeoPixel LEDs as long as they're a five volt logic LED. Those work fine for this project. In this case, um, I modified the original instructions a little bit and used a strip because it fits just fine and it saves me a bunch of soldering. On the subject of soldering, you'll need a few pieces of scrap wire and and a soldering iron to solder the wires onto your LED strips. Now, if you haven't done this before, I'll show you here in a minute kind of how to, how to do that. There are plenty of tutorials out there on soldering onto LED strips. It's a good thing to practice, but it, you may need some scraps you may make some mistakes and burn out LEDs, but it's a good thing to do if you're gonna be into this project quite a bit. You will not be able to use any of the adapters because of the size constraints for this project. So this is a good opportunity to get in the habit of starting to be able to solder onto an LED strip. Now I'm using one of these TS100 USB PD powered soldering irons. These things are great, they're adjustable, and the best part is you can run these off of a battery, a battery bank if it's got USB PD in it. Uh, if you're an uh, RC person, you can run these off of RC batteries. You can run them off pretty much anything as long as you get the red voltage. They're really super flexible and you can dial them in. They heat up almost instantly. So we've got links to all these items here, including the soldering iron in the description here below. Now, in addition to the LED strips, you're gonna need some scrap wire, um, something in the 20 gauge or smaller range. You can use 18 gauge, but it's a little thick. That's what I actually used on the original version of the product. Project, and they're a little hard to maneuver, so it would be better idea to go down with a 20 gauge, especially since it's such a short area. Um, get something that small. And then finally, for this particular project, there is a 3D printable enclosure that I've got linked in the description. Now, I, because of my ESP32 being a slight bit bigger than a standard ESP32 or D D1 Mini, I had to print these at 15% larger, so 115% on all three axes. So they made it a little bit larger. As you can see here, this is the original, and then this is the one I printed for my my instance. So you see, it's about 15% larger. It's big enough to hold the ESP32 that I have. I didn't want to have to buy a pack of D1 Mini, so I got lazy and just went ahead and scaled it up. So again, you can scale this up if you want to use a slightly larger one. It is not going to fit exactly in this little inner cavity in here, but that's okay. There's still plenty of room in there, but you can go ahead and use the LED strip even on the smaller version as well. And then you're going to need some miscellaneous hardware. Um, in my case, I'm using M2.5 screws for the larger version. Um, if you're going with a smaller D1 mini size, you can use M2 screws to do this. Self-tapping are great. You can pick them up from your local Home Depot or wherever you get your hardware. But I have some links in the description to a pack you can get off Amazon if you can't get those from your local store. And then of course, you're gonna need some sort of double-sided tape to stick it to wherever you wanna place it and then a relatively long USB micro cable. Now I have some leftover ones for my wise cameras and those are perfect because they're flat and they're able to slip in through the door jam. So these work great for this type of setup, but any type of USB cable that you want so that you can extend it to the area that you want to place this outside your door. All right, with all the requirements of the way, let's jump into the hardware. Now that we know what we need to accomplish this project, let's go ahead and get started with the soldering. Now, I'm going to be doing the first step here. I'm gonna go ahead and solder the LED strip. Now, this is a scrap piece of LED that I've got. I'm actually doing on the back side of it. I don't think it will matter. Arrows usually point in the direction that the strip goes. Um, I'm gonna solder the other end because the end I need to solder on is already trashed. So just ignore that. I'm just using this for an example to show you what it looks like. So I've got my strip right here. Uh, it's a good idea to have some way to securing it down while you're working on this. You solder your iron out and fire it up. Once it's up to temperature, Let's grab our solder. The first thing we need to do is go ahead and heat up the pad. We're gonna go ahead and start with the five volt pad here. We're gonna apply some pressure and we wanna get a nice bead of solder on there because you're basically, you're tinning the pad in order to allow our wire to stick to it easier. All right, and so then I've already cut and stripped these wires down. Obviously both sides are gonna need to be cut and stripped and it's a good idea to go ahead and strip them down in case you make a mistake. Now if you're interested in any of the tools that I use, I do have a link in the description and right here on screen to my recommended electronics tools that you can just buy right off of Amazon in case you don't have any of this stuff. But if you've got what you get from Home Depot, it's all the same stuff, but just if you're looking for a kit, I've got a link there in the description. All right, so we have all the wires stripped. And it's always a good idea to go ahead and tin the ends of the wires as well. So to do that, all we need to do is place the soldering iron tip on the wire, let it get nice and warm, and then we'll just flow some solder right into that wire. You want to make sure you get a good coating on there. That'll make this job much faster. 
Now I like to start with the middle wire first. That way you've got more space and you, you don't start crowding into yourself there. So again, it might be good idea to use a pair of pliers. That way if the wire does get hot, you don't get burnt. And we'll go ahead and line that up. So I'm using white in this case for my data line. So just line those two up and then press the soldering iron, both the wire and the pad, tinned pad warm. And it looks like it pretty, stuck pretty well. So let's do the same thing for the five volt. Make sure you get both liquefied so you don't get a cold solder joint. And then let's grab the black wire. All right, there we go. We've got all three wires on there. So now that we've got the LED strip soldered, it's always a good idea to go ahead and apply a little bit of heat shrink. In this case, we can put it from the LED side over the top, so you only need a tiny little bit, and use that heat shrink to protect the contacts just in case. Now, I've already finished this on an additional piece of wiring. This is actually my, for my test unit. I just cut the, clip the wires down shorter, so I'm not gonna use this the rest of the time. I'm gonna use the one I've already got done. So if you see the wire colors changed, don't be concerned. So this one already has a bit of heat shrink on there. And you'll notice I do have two, two green wires, but I know which one's the data and which one's the ground. I just didn't have any other wire color at the time. So now I'm gonna take these wires as well and go ahead and tin them so that way these are easier to make contact. Now, like I said before, if you select too large of a wire gauge, the problem you're gonna have is you won't be able to pass the wire through the hole. So most stranded wires are not gonna be able to fit through these tiny little holes here. So we're gonna actually have to solder onto the top of the pad, which is perfectly fine. It's just a little bit difficult to get everything oriented sometimes. All right, so the wires are tinned now. Now comes the fun part, getting everything to fit. So the first thing we wanna do is take our case and see how everything's gonna line up in the case. I'm gonna do this with the actual ESP chip facing downward. Uh, there is a notch in here, but that does not fit um, this particular ESP. So, but there's still plenty of room in the case, so it's not a problem. So how we're gonna do this is we're going to put the strip in like so, wrap around the whole thing, and then our contacts are gonna come out like this. So we're, it looks like our first contact's gonna be over here on this side where the data line goes, and that's gonna be probably our most difficult solder joint. So you look at the wiring diagram that I provided, you'll see that we're gonna be using three pins on this ESP device. We're gonna be using the VCC port. It's not usually a good idea to use the VCC port to source power for something, but because this is such a low current usage, it's not a problem, and, it, and I've tested it and it works fine on this particular chip. So we're gonna use the VCC in the ground for obviously five volt and, and ground, and then we're gonna be using uh, IO5, the uh, IO5 port on this particular chipset, but make sure you match it up to whatever it is on your particular one. But you just gotta make sure that whichever data, you gotta use a digital output, and also make sure that that matches whatever's in your code, which we'll do later on. Like I said, the hard part's gonna be kinda of coming in at a backwards angle here. So we have quite a few grounds we can choose from, so that's not a big deal. Actually choose a ground on the other side. So it looks like we're our, we'll go ahead and do the, the center pin first then. So since I'm gonna be kind of doing it, it's gonna be kind of coming out this way. Let's go ahead and bring this middle pin back here. I already have the pad tinned from before, just like we did with the LED. So I was gonna do the tin your pads so that way you don't uh, run into problems. This is probably not gonna translate very well on camera, but we'll try. Gotta make sure we don't make contact with another IO pin. All right, that looks like that works. So then let's get the VCC next. And we're going to do the ground the same way. So again, not the prettiest solder job in the world, but it should work. So we'll go ahead and place that into our enclosure, making sure everything can line up appropriately. You may have to do a little squeezing and squishing to get everything to fit properly, because it, it is a tight fit. Now be careful when you're squeezing and squishing, because you don't want to break your, your wires or break your contacts off or anything like that. So there we go. Here we go. Now we've got a product that's all in the container itself. Now, so the power light, so if you plug it in and the power light comes on, it means you didn't smoke the thing. That's good. Now, obviously the lights aren't gonna come on on the LEDs because we haven't put the program on it yet. One thing you might wanna do is go ahead and remove this red power LED because if you have this sitting like on your door at night, it will shine red even if it's off. It's hard to connect it in. So you need to actually remove the LED or cut the trace either way to get rid of that. So I'll be doing that here in a second. All right, so now that our hardware build is done, let's take the lid, make sure it fits on. It's a little snug, but that's fine. Should work just, just perfectly fine. If you get a pinch, you can make a little collar like this, pushing your 3D object down into the bed and just having it print only this top section or cutting it in the slicer, and it creates a little collar. So if you do run into a problem where you can't get all your stuff to fit, you can 3D print a little collar 
and then go from there. All right, so now we finished the physical build out of the busy light. Like I said in the introduction, this is part one of a two part video series. So we're gonna finish the software in the next part. Now, if you can't wait until part two coming out in a couple of days, I do have all of the software listed out in the blog post. Now you can take this, set up your own ESP home environment and then flash it to your ESP to get the lights working and get off and running. I also have some Arduino software that you can go ahead and flash to test out the lights if you want to right now. Now make sure to check out part two where I show you how to set up ESP home in your home assistant environment to flash your ESP with the software so you can use it as a busy light and some automations that I use to get statuses from things like Teams, my computer's microphone and others to make this busy light function. So when that video is uploaded, you can get to it by going here. If you want to see some more Home Assistant projects, you can click on the playlist right here. And as always, if you haven't already, please make sure you subscribe to the channel by clicking our logo right here. Thanks again, and we'll see you in the next video.